Love and Watches is a podcast for male and female watch lovers alike. Perpetual Girl and Ranch Racer are a watch crazy wife and husband team that are dedicated to discussing the latest and greatest in the world of watches. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey, watch fam. Welcome. This is Ranch Racer. And this is Perpetual Girl. And welcome to episode number two of Love and Watches. We hope you guys uh, enjoyed episode one. That was kind of just our intro, right? So today, what are we talking about? Well, first of all, I have to giggle a little because even though people can't see us, I sort of feel the need to not be in my bathrobe. <laughs> or you get you get kind of dolled up for these. It's yeah, I sort of. I mean, I don't. I don't mind it. Actually styled my hair. I'm showered. Yeah. That's always good. So you right. have to be presentable. Yeah. So shower once a week, whether you need it or not. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Do you want to start with a wrist check? Y- actually? Yeah. Why don't we do a wrist check and then, <clears throat> excuse me, then we'll get into the, the topic of the show. Okay. So go for it. Uh, well, I actually started out this morning with my, citizen eco drive watch on and i can't remember the model but it's no longer made um it's a solar watch and i posted it on instagram today and it's the one that you bought me yeah we'll we'll, i'll post a link to it in the show notes but then i did switch to my omega Speedmaster because i was using the chronograph to time how long one of my animals was outside so it was very useful there you go. See, you're already getting a use out of a complication. Right. And like my it. watch is the probably the most feminine of the Speedmasters. And it's got the mother of pearl dial, the white bezel. And it does have pink hands, which I was really turned off by that for a long time before I made the decision to get it. Because of all things, I, I sort of thought that I was hoping that they would use something other than baby pink, but it you know, looking at it in real life, it's really beautiful with it. So, yeah, I reacted a little bit too soon. Well, when you, I mean, when you look at pictures on manufacturer websites, they're so macro. I mean, they're so zoomed in; you see every little detail. And when you actually look at a watch in person, you don't. It's totally the naked different. eye doesn't it, notice the details. This watch is completely different in real life. So yeah, and you do have some a little bit of bling around the subdials, but. You could have gone more feminine with like the whole diamond bezel and everything, but that gets pretty right. This pretty does bling. not have that. Yeah, that gets pretty bling. How about yeah, you? These are, you? I, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just love the the Omegas. They're awesome. And really, what are you really wearing cool today? Watches. Uh, so today, I am wearing my Seiko Turtle Pepsi bezel diver. Uh, I don't know the reference number. I'm just not one of those guys who memorizes reference numbers. But something else we can put in the show notes. So this is the watch that if you guys listen to episode number one uh, you heard perpetual girl mention that she knocked it out of the park with my it was my actually this was my birthday mm-hmm. and uh yeah she did she bought this from our local great little seiko uh, authorized dealer here in town and, and i was sneaky very sneaky well i was not expecting it and it's just so cool i mean i uh the, the loom for one on these seikos is like amazing i mean it doesn't get a whole lot better when it comes to loom than than with seiko's loom and for a long time this was kind of my go-to watch at night because the loom lasted literally from the moment i hopped into bed to uh, the next morning so love this watch wear it quite a bit it's kind of been displaced a little bit as my night watch we'll talk about that uh, in another episode so anyway that's okay. it for for the wrist check so Today we're going to get into a topic we had originally not planned on talking about for a few episodes, but based on kind of some stuff we've seen on Instagram and just our conversations over the last few days, uh, we are going to talk about quartz and automatic. Right. My, the point of discussion that that I want to bring up, the big point for today, is I feel that women get less, not in all cases, but I feel in many cases, women get less for their money than men when it comes to wristwatches. And we can start off by telling a little story. Uh, a bunch of my girlfriends, when I explain what I'm wearing, you know, what kind of watch I'm wearing, and I explain 
oh, it's an automatic watch. They kind of look at me with the puzzled look. What is that? And they say, well, what does that mean? So pretty much every one of my friends, my girlfriends, they don't know the difference between a quartz and an automatic or mechanical wind watch. So I think for the discussion today, we just discuss automatic versus quartz. And I know it's a topic that's been discussed over and over on the internet, yeah. on big, on other big web- websites, other podcasts. But I want to talk about it because I think it's really pertinent to our, the model that we're basing our podcast around, you know, with a discussion between a man and a woman and watches and how they, how it applies to women wearing watches and men wearing watches. So I'm going to go ahead and let Ranch Racer uh, discuss the differences between quartz watches and automatic watches. Yeah, and and I'm not going to go into a ton of detail. For one, I think most people listening to this podcast, if you're listening, you probably are very well aware of the differences. Uh, And However, I'm hoping that we're going to get some ladies involved that are maybe going to work uh, with their, you know, going to work with their podcasts or driving somewhere with their husband and they're, you know, hey, you've got, there's a new podcast that it's a husband and wife team and the, the woman is talking about watches and hopefully I think education is a big, uh, big thing for a lot of people, women and men. And, and that is going to go, I'm going to talk about that later as well. Okay. So, so let's start at, at the beginning and I'll just make this really quick. Like I said, a mechanical watch up until about the late sixties, early seventies, all watches were mechanical. And what that means is there is a long wound up spring or long spring inside kind of a circular spring that gets wound up. Traditionally you would, grab the crown on the side of the watch and wind it manually to put tension in that spring. Uh, And then as that tension is released in that spring, there's a a gear train, a set of gears, and it comes down to something called the escapement. And through a process that I won't go into detail right now, the escapement kind of clicks back and forth. And that's what, what creates the, the, um, you know, the timekeeping. That's what moves the seconds hand. So that is a traditional mechanical when it winds down, it stops working, right? So then we had what was called the automatic, which is simply a mechanical with a spinning rotor on the back that's attached to the spring. So as your wrist moves, that spinning rotor spins around and winds the mainspring. So that, like I said, up until the 60s or 70s, that was how watches worked. Now, at that time, Seiko and some other manufacturers, and Seiko, I think, is credited with being the first, but Seiko came out with the quartz movement. And basically all that is, it's a quartz crystal, tiny little quartz crystal that, that operates at a certain frequency. And I don't remember that exact frequency. It's like 32,000 something, something, something Hertz. But basically it resonates at that same frequency all the time. So then you have a little integrated circuit in the watch and the battery powers the quartz crystal the quartz crystals frequency is fed into that little integrated circuit, excuse me. And then the integrated circuit is what moves a little stepper motor to turn the hands. So what you're saying is quartz is a very sophisticated high tech piece of equipment with a battery Yeah, it, and a chip. It's high tech and plastic. I, and I almost bit of think, metal. I mean, if you ask me, I almost think mechanical is, is more uh, complex but definitely, you know, quartz is its thing. And the real, the thing with quartz and they ended up calling it the quartz crisis in the seventies because they were so cheap, right? You could go out and buy a Casio calculator watch or, you know, a Seiko basic three handed quartz watch for 50 bucks or even less, even 20 bucks. Right. And the, the traditional Swiss mechanical manu- watch manufacturers were completely caught off guard. They were behind and so they created this, what they called the quartz crisis, where the mechanical watch almost went away. But then in these, I think it was like in the 90s, it really came back strong. And today it's, it's kind of a flourishing market again. So that's the different, that's kind of the high level overview of the quartz versus mechanical slash automatic. And what we're really going to kind of talk about today is the market and what you get when you buy a mechanical watch versus a quartz watch. Right. So. So a quartz watch is extremely accurate. It's affordable. Yep. It's very, it's got a lot of high tech components to it, like a chip and a battery. Yeah. Plastic. 
I mean, you could, you could buy a twenty dollars quartz watch that's going to be more accurate than a fifty thousand dollar or, or million dollar Correct. mechanical watch but all day long. But the craftsmanship and the technology in a traditional real watch, and I, I, I use that term loosely, <laughs> it, it's not going to ever go away. You can find a hundred. You have hundred year old pocket watches. Yep. That still work. They need. They require maintenance. So that's one con with the mechanical watches that they do require maintenance every five years or so, unless you have a Vostok and you probably don't need to maintain it as often <laughs> as show. I've heard, Different show. <laughs> as I've heard, but, um, accuracy of a quartz watch is going to be superior. It, yeah. Pretty much in all cases. And, and now, unless you have my Speedmaster, which is almost dead on accurate, well, which is an anomaly. And the thing is with quartz watches, remember I mentioned that 32,000, right? That 32 K or 32,000 Hertz. There have been more modern, like Bulova has got a 262,000 Hertz watch. That's way more accurate. Like your typical quartz watch, I think is 10 to 15 seconds a month off. Whereas a good, you know, a good quality mechanical is plus or minus, you know, two to five seconds a day. So they're more accurate. But then if you get into the really high frequency quartz, there's now, I think Citizen came out with a new movement, quartz movement that I'm going to be writing a review on for wristwatchreview.com. And that thing is like one or one or two seconds per year accurate. So you so almost, you wouldn't have to set that maybe in your lifetime, depending on how old you are. Well, you got to replace the battery, right? When the battery dies, right. you reset it. But I mean, that's amazingly within 10 years, you're 10 seconds off. That's really amazing. So this is a, a battery power, not a solar. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. Actually, no, I think it is solar. So there's no battery. So there's, um, usually it's, if it's a solar powered watch, there's going to be a capacitor instead of a battery. So you maybe after 10 years, you're going to replace the capacitor or something. So yeah, it, it's, it's really accuracy is where quartz shines. But when I opened up the back of a quartz watch to show you when you'd never seen yes, one, what'd I you remember. think? I was, I was shocked at how small and how it looked, just looked like it didn't look like what I thought a watch would look like on the inside because I'd seen the inside of all your pocket watches and the exhibition backs on our, um, even our Invictas had the exhibition backs and you could see all the jewels in the gears when you popped open that watch, which was, I think it's about a 40 millimeter case. Yep. And the movement was maybe. It, it was like maybe, 15, 20 <laughs> no, millimeters. No, it's like 10 or it's tiny. eight or 10 millimeter diameter. And there's empty space all around it. And it's like this is just a bunch of cheap plastic. So mm -hmm. I was, I'm thinking to myself, wow, that could be inside one of my very expensive ladies quartz watches. And I was, yeah, uh, it was an eye opener there. For those of us that love watches, there's something about having that little mechanical machine on your wrist. That just that when you think about all it needs is, service every five to 10 years, new oil, new grease, right? A, a professional goes in and services it. That thing could last several generations, like 100, 200, 300 years. It'll just keep going as long as it's maintained. Quartz, plastic, you know, battery, battery acid. Take your batteries out of your quartz watches, folks, if you don't wear them regularly, because that battery, as it loses juice, it'll actually leak acid out into the movement, so. And I'm gonna talk about that a little later too. Yeah. But... Uh, okay, so where was I going with this? Well, so we talked about the differences and the pros and the cons. Yeah. And I guess that leads us into watch trends. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about trends of days gone by. So I have small vintage watches. I have some Bulovas from the 20s. They're tiny. And they're mechanical wind-up movements. So I know that women's watches, no matter how small they are, can have an automatic or a wind-up movement in it. Yeah, they're... Not so much an automatic, because that adds another layer, layer. Yeah. But they could have a mechanical movement. So I know it can be done. Yeah. Um, that was all that was done. I mean, wristwatches came about for women, for the most part, for ladies, because they didn't have a pocket to put their pocket watch in, right? So... Mm -hmm. Or a pendant. Yeah. So they started putting bracelets on them, basically, and turned them into, I guess, jewelry for your wrist with a, with a watch head on it. And they were tiny. I mean... Yeah, like your Bulova Miss America, that thing's like 10 millimeters so across or 15. Small. It's really small. Right. It's got a tiny little mechanical movement in it. What do you find today? So today, ladies' watches, I've seen both automatic and quartz.
But I'm seeing that a lot of the time, even in high, high end watches, very nice brands, they're using quartz yeah, movements. It, and yeah. I, be, I I don't agree that it's the size of the watch that is requiring that they use a quartz movement because I know that if they tweak it, it could accommodate an automatic movement or even a wind up. But totally. uh, that's where I, I wonder, I wonder overall, do women, do women care what are powering their watches? You do. I, I do because now I'm educated and, and I hate to use the word ignorant. And I know that sounds like a bad word, but I think it's true. if more women understood what was in the watch and understood the staying power of an heirloom. A watch can be an heirloom and it'll last hundreds of years, like mm -hmm. a pocket watch that is found up in a pile of leaves in a, a gold a gold rush era dig site. You know, you're gonna you have an heirloom here and you if you're gonna buy a very expensive watch, you know, that that watch could be around for generations. And I don't yep. think a plastic movement inside and, and I I I'm not sure I'm not, I'm not sure that there's a difference between a really, really good quartz movement and a really cheap quartz so movement. There is. There is. A, a, like a high-end one, like in a Grand Seiko, you're not going to find plastic in that for the most part. I mean, it's all metal, beautiful decoration, right? So a Grand Seiko, I think it's it's either the 9F or the 9S. One of those is their high beat uh, mechanical and the other is the quartz. But the point is, it's a hand-built quartz movement. So they're beautiful. I mean, they're actually something to look at and they're pricey they're and they're super accurate so yeah there there is a difference but the fact is you can put a junky cheap quartz movement in a 15 or 20 dollar watch and it's going to be more accurate than your omega speedmaster on your wrist right that's just correct how it is so my question is do women care about what is in the watch and do the manufacturers care that we care some do and that so that i think i'm seeing a change and you know the fact of the matter is it's a male dominated hobby for sure. Right. And the micro brand world. I agree with that because I feel like sure. women are left out a lot and I'm not a feminist by any means, but I really feel like watch industry is primarily focused towards men, for, especially, yeah, especially totally. lately with micro brands. There, there's a lot of super beautiful watches and they're, they're giant. There's very few micro brand watches for, smaller wrists for women. And the thing is I can go out all day long and buy a really cool micro brand watch for under $500 that has a high quality Seiko or Miyota, or in some cases, even a Swiss ETA mechanical, you know, automatic movement. And then, and you know, I, I, I don't like to slam brands, but then you look at like the Cartier Panther that's what four, between four and 5,000 to start, right? It's a beautiful watch. It's beautiful, but it's stainless steel. The starting watch, the starting price of between four and five thousand, you get a stainless steel watch with a quartz movement inside. And I, I'm in love with it's the Santos. Ridiculous. But the Santos is no longer made for you women. Still, you can still get them online, and I and I love the Santos for men medium. I'm thinking, hmm, would the medium be too big on my wrist if, if I were to yeah, you be able try, to, to acquire that one? But but again, I just I can't justify buying a steel watch with no diamonds in it and. I can understand where if you put a quartz movement in a watch with a lot of diamonds and you're, you're making up for that cost with the gems or the metals like gold, but I'm seeing a lot of steel watches for women that are priced. They're priced at the level that an automatic watch is priced at with diamonds. Yep. And I'm having a tough time with that. So do women do manufacturers, are they kind of taking advantage of women, you know, just looking at it as jewelry I think it depends on the manufacturer. I mean, like your Speedmaster, that's a 38 mil, which for a sporty chronograph is fine for your six and a half inch wrist, right? That would be like me wearing a 42 to 44 on my seven and a half. So there are manufacturers that care. Um, you know, some of the ones that come to mind, like Oris, they're making some killer 36 millimeter divers. Uh, what, what's the the tutor that came out at the uh, tutor black bay Basel. they have a is it a 32 it's either a 31 or a 32 that black dial beautiful and, and that's that, clearly you know that you know that women. that's marketed for women oh totally and i love that it's actually modeled after their black bay line so it looks like a mini me of the men's version which i think a lot of women not every woman just wants a bunch of bling and have a bracelet watch 
Well, and that's, so that's the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the bling because it also bugs me when a manufacturer just sticks on a bunch of diamonds blinded by the bling charges 10 grand and puts a really cheap quartz movement inside when they could spend a little bit more increase their cost by just a little bit and put an off the shelf mechanical movement in it and give you a real timepiece. And I, you know, I think part of it is they're making a little more money because they're saving on the, on the movement. And I think there's also probably an aspect of, they feel that a woman is wearing a watch more as jewelry and so the, that woman doesn't want to hassle with having to get it, you know, having to get that watch serviced every few years because it'll stop working if you don't service a mechanical movement. Correct. Whereas when the court stops, they just think, oh, my battery's dead. They take it to the store, get a new battery, and they're, they're back and running. So I think, I think there's a couple of different aspects, but we are seeing more manufacturers now starting to decrease the size of their watches release like IWC releasing more female focused watches with mechanical movements. Correct. So again, Ranch Racer and I are not against quartz. We own a number of quartz watches. We have a good variety, but f- to me, if I'm going to spend $10,000 on a watch, I kind of almost feel like that's like putting and no offense to Ford because we have Ford vehicles and we love them, but it's almost like putting a Ford escort motor into a BMW. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and or a, a giant, even Ford if I'm going to spend a thousand or 2000, I want a mechanical movement in that thing. I don't want to like, if I went and bought a grand Seiko, I would buy a mechanical, you know, either their high, their high beat or their spring drive, which is freaking awesome. And we'll talk about that <laughs> in another episode. But, so it's about choices. I would like yeah. to have a choice. I would like to be able to buy what I want Instead of having a manufacturer decide for me, assuming that since I'm a woman, I want everything to be pink and I want everything to be rose gold and I want everything to be diamonds on it. And I have to, I have to think that not all women want that. But as long as women are buying it, that's what they're going to, like, if you look at uh, like these, I've seen a couple. So is it an affectation or is it? I th- well, I don't know if it's an affectation because the Panther is expensive. It's five grand, right? But if you look at the, you'll see a Panther post from Cartier, and there's tons of women that are like upvoting it, love, and love, thumbs love. up. This is beautiful. It's awesome, and they don't have a clue what's inside. I guarantee they don't. You. But I've also seen reviews about it, and even reviews from women who have said, "Gosh, this is such a stunning piece," and I agree, it's stunning, but. They've almost said, well, you know, I'm just going to, I, what I gain from it is that. Oh, she like giving in. I know exactly what review you're you're talking about. That you're saying that it's okay that it's a quartz because I'm wearing it because the name is great and it's a, a a keepsake and it's, it stands for itself. So that basically tells me that you're buying it for the name and you're wearing it to show the name and that you can afford it. And that's. I, I kind of don't, I don't want to go there. What, what really bugged me about that review is that she did not call out that it was insane that you were spending that kind of money for a stainless steel watch, right? Because you weren't for, even for getting materials, you weren't getting materials. white gold. You weren't getting any diamonds. I mean, there was nothing right. Except for the, whatever the, the name. Blue. Yeah. It's for I, the I mean, name. It's, it literally, and which is okay. I, Not everybody's I paradise is everybody else's paradise. I agree. So but I, as long as people alienate. do that, aren't they going to continue to, to me, that's correct. It sets a trend. Off. It sets a trend. And off. I've seen a couple of, posts on Instagram the last couple of days where people say, why, why does someone in the industry or someone knowledgeable have to tell me what I should like? And why should I like what this person likes? You shouldn't, you should like what you like, buy what you love and love what you buy. Well, and it's, you know, it's, it's this and is be kind educated. Of, I think it's a different topic, but these brands with all these ridiculous brand ambassadors and they, you know, do these ads for these brand ambassadors that are getting paid tons of money and partying on yachts and in the Monaco Harbor to sell their watches. I think to me, that's very similar, right? They're trying to sell this. Are we selling a watch or are we selling? Yeah. And and like you you said, there's a portray. I mean, there's, there's a, I guess a place for everything, but as watch collectors and as people that are listening to this podcast, it should bug you that a stainless steel watch with a basic quartz movement costs five grand, right? That should just tick you off and it ticks me off. So I I guess the moral is, I look at watches as more 
when it comes to something more expensive, I look at it with sentimentality. And I'd like it to, you know, if you have children, I'm sure you want your children to have your watches. We don't have children. But someone's going to inherit my watch someday, whether it's from a pawn shop or eBay. And it's going to be around for a long, long time. So that makes me feel good. Yeah, for sure. If it's a quartz movement, it may not be around. But if I'm going to invest in it, I'd like it to, you know, I I sort of look at it that way with with sentiment. Yeah, I... And craftsmanship. I don't look, you know, from a guy's point of view, I look at my quartz pieces, they're cool, but I don't look at those as something that I would, you know, pass on to nieces and nephews or kids if we had them, right? I don't, that's not like an heirloom piece. My mechanicals, that's how I look at those. I mean, I think the most I've ever spent on a quartz was like 600 bucks or something on that Bulova Precisionist, which it's an awesome movement. It's super cool. It's amazing. Very sporty. The functionality, the the complications in it are awesome how it works, but it's still just a cool quartz watch. It's not it's not special to me like my mechanicals are. And I think I have more opportunity to have that feeling than most women collectors do. Unless you can afford, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollar Audemars PK millinaries and those types of really super high end you're very wealthy then i guess you've got you're spoiled for choice when it comes to women's mechanicals but mm-hmm. as just your everyday basic collector that's not the case i don't there are plen- pre- plenty of brands excuse me that make wonderful women's automatics and we talked about this in the first show i mean may have i can't remember but anyway like tiso bulova starting to do more um we mentioned oris today mm-hmm. and, um, and tudor but, there, there are some great ones but to kind of sum it up in closing Women are about 50% of our planet. So I think it's a huge market. And I know that there are manufacturers that market to a set characteristic. And I don't think they're hitting at all. I think they're missing out on a lot of potential of the women who like certain things. And we're just kind of being put in a a box. Like I I don't meet the same box. I love blingy things and I love sparkle, but... You know, I, I spent 300 on a Bulova with all crystals around it that look just like a, a Cartier, but it's a quartz movement and I wear it if I want to look super dressy or on Christmas or another holiday or, you know, something where I want something super bracelet like, but, you know, I personally would not spend $10,000 on the same piece. So I think that's... um a market well, it, that people are, I think that manufacturers are missing out on right now. They are, but I think they're starting, I think some of them are starting to get it. And like you said, you know, women make up 50% of the population. I guarantee you they don't make up 50% of the watch collecting population, but I think they could be a bigger I think they percentage. Could. I think they could if they learned more. And I'm going to give props to George's Kern because, so he kind of turned IWC around and just recently came over to Breitling and he's ruffling a lot of feathers because... He's kind of getting away from the whole Breitling girls, John Travolta, gigantic 46 millimeter, you know, super complicated pilot watch. I mean, I think they'll always have those, but he's released some new lines that are way more friendly for, for women. I sent you, you and, did. and my sister and one, my sister's it. also a watch nut. And, you know, I think it's got the new, I want to say it has the new B01 movement in it, but I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it's, it's a cool three hander. It's not it a is, and it's classy. It doesn't have diamonds on it. It's got a really very um, elegant beaded pattern around the bezel. And it, I really like it. Do you remember it. the size? Was it a 38 or was it like a 40? I think it was a 40 or a 41. But for that type of watch, you could totally do it, right? I mean, your Seiko mm-hmm. Monster is like because a 40 Because it's, it's got a very complicated dial. And and I, I feel that the Breitlings are pretty complicated for me because they're, I mean, they're too large for me. But seeing that, well, and they got the whole slide rule. I liked it. Yeah, I really liked it. Breitling's always been acquired taste, and it's never been, there's never been offerings for women, and that's changing. And not just for women, people who have smaller wrists, right? But I think it's, those are good examples of, I think, the market's starting to get it. And the Swiss, the Swiss watch industry has lots of problems, and we'll address those over multiple shows as we get the podcast going. But that's one thing I do see some brands are starting to fix. Um, brands like Cartier, I'd like to see them turn it around. They have some great, like some of the offerings they have for men, they're awesome, but I, I'm really disappointed with them when it comes to their, 
offerings for women. I think they well, can do I better. I feel that women are having to change their interests, you know, to, to kind of pick what's available. Like, oh, you know, I'd really like this to be smaller, but I could probably squeeze that on my wrist. So I think we're having yeah. to sort of just take, you know, take what's out there and try to fit it into our, what we like, try to squeeze that into what works for us. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I, I think that's kind of, you nailed it, right? There's, there's just not enough offerings. So hopefully we'll see more brands starting to get it. Brands like Tudor and Breitling, I think are going to lead the way and Oris. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think we, I think we pretty much uh, beat this one to death today, huh? We did. And there's more to come because we didn't even get into materials and colors and things like that, but that'll be a great discussion for another time. For sure. Cool. All right. Well, guys and gals, that's pretty much what we had for you. I think we're, we're just right around 30 minutes. So I think we're going to call it a day and sign off. I'm Ranch Racer. And I'm Perpetual Girl. And thanks a bunch for joining us. We'll see you on the next podcast. Bye-bye.